In this episode, I talk all things books with Nicole, who is the creator of the Instagram page, Book Led Learning. We discuss what it looks like to create a culture of reading within your family, being open to our children choosing the books that speak to them versus controlling their choices, and how books not only connect us to knowledge and information, but to one another. We touch on the differences in when children read and how they interact with books, incorporating fiction and nonfiction, the beauty of audiobooks, book parties, and being willing to read books again and again to your young children. Nicole offers great suggestions for books parents can read too and share some things you may not know about her. We briefly talk about their journey to homeschooling, but you can hear a more in-depth discussion on my second episode, When Did You Know?, where Nicole was one of the five moms who shared her story. Don't forget to check the show notes for a list of all the books mentioned. Here's my conversation with Nicole. I'm Nicole, and I live in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, I live with my husband and my two boys. I have a 12-year-old and an almost 7-year-old. Um, we have actually lived in Las Vegas uh, our entire lives, both my husband and I. And so we don't really have an interesting story about how we wound up in the desert full of casinos. <laughs> um <laughs> But uh, it's actually quite a good city for homeschooling because there are a lot of homeschoolers here, uh, which may seem surprising, but there is quite a big community. And maybe it's because our public school system is not known as one of the best in the country, for sure. Hmm. So, um, but yeah, we, uh, we are desert dwellers and we like to get outside and uh, mountain biking, which is kind of a new thing for me, but my three guys uh, really enjoy that. Hiking, um, we do get up to the mountains. Um, we do have mountains nearby, so um, and we actually don't go down to the strip very often, but there are some cultural things to do around here, but that is something that I kind of wish we had a little bit more of mm. uh, where we live, but we do find plenty to do here. Um, so no shortage of things to do. Yeah, so we're native Las Vegans here. And my boys have never set foot in a school. Okay. So I'll I was, say yeah, that I was, too. <laughs> I was going to ask you about that. Like, where where are they as far as their trajectory of school experience and attendance? And then maybe what we can do is just sort of talk a little bit about how you got to homeschooling just briefly. And then we'll get into all the things books. Sounds because great. that's exactly why I want you on this podcast <laughs> is to talk about books. So our homeschool story, sort of the short version, is that um, I was a public school teacher here in Las Vegas, and I taught for five years before my oldest was born. Um, and But sometime during my first year of teaching, I, I don't know, read about, saw something on TV about homeschooling. And so it kind of planted a seed in my head about this other option. And at that point, you know, I'm in the classroom, I'm seeing, you know, what it's really like with 32 fourth graders and what that actually means. And so I just kind of started thinking about homeschooling. So quite early on in the game. Um, and then by the time my you know son was born and he was about three years old, my husband was on board. You know, it's like, as long as I'm able to stay home, you know, I really want to homeschool. And so I started reading all about homeschooling. I read pretty widely. I didn't have any specific um, style of homeschooling in mind because I didn't really know anything about it. Mm -hmm. So I just started reading all the books that I could find. I sought out some homeschoolers at that point just to kind of make some connections, even though three, you know, was young to start getting into the homeschool world. But by the time he was four, almost five, he has a winter birthday, so he wouldn't have started kindergarten until the following year. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I think we're ready to jump in here. But I didn't feel the pressure at that point, I guess. You know, I always thought as a teacher and like feeling like I'm a very type A organized, you know, list kind of checker person that I was going to, you know, follow the lists and follow the mm -hmm. curriculum or whatever. <laughs> but with him still technically being a preschooler when we started, I didn't feel that pressure to do any of that yet. And we never really did what you would call like preschool at home. I tried some things with him, but he was not really interested. And so I stopped like 
wasting my time printing out and cutting out all the little yeah. like, cutesy <laughs> preschool things because that was not for him. And so mm-hmm. I eventually figured out, like, I'm just not going to spend my time prepping things that he's not going to do. Um, but we just, uh, this is, I mean, our story with books really kind of starts when he was born, but, you know, books were a huge part of our early homeschooling, but also just not having the pressure of needing a curriculum, I think helped us step into kind of the more, um, child led, uh, approach, even though at that time I didn't really realize that was what we were really doing. And a lot of experimenting on my first kid, you know, or whatever, but, Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they get that they get that honor, don't they? Yeah, they it's, the it's like, well, <laughs> yeah, you're the guinea pig. So <laughs> he definitely was, but I also am really grateful that it worked out the way that it did because I don't know if we would have been the same homeschoolers we are now if he wasn't my first with just what he needed in his personality. Um, so I feel like he kind of put us on this route of being more child led than maybe my second kid would have, if he had been the first, you know, of course that's hard to tell, but, Mm -hmm. um, I know what you're saying though. (laughs) I've definitely seen that and heard that. I felt that way as as well. Like my, my oldest being who he was at the time when he was school age, I remember thinking, you know, he, he needs to stay home with us because this is just his personality. And, um, if I flipped it and saw his sister first, she was, had just such a, she came out like, where's the party? Yes. <laughs> and and yes. so it's very interesting. I do wonder the same thing sometimes like, huh, how would things look if we had different birth orders? Yeah. So as far as books are concerned, let's step back a little bit too, and just think about your childhood and how were books, how did, how were they used? How did you use them yourself? How were they used in your family? Did you notice that you gravitated towards books when you were a little girl in school? And what was your schooling experience like in in regards to reading? So some of my strongest reading memories as a younger kid, but sometimes it's hard for me to place my actual age. I have more like we lived Mm -hmm. in this house or this house when this happened, but was my dad actually, um, he's kind of a storyteller. He doesn't do it as much now, but I just remember him telling me and my brother, the story of the Hobbit, you know, not Mm. reading it to us, but just kind of, you know, storytelling, like as a bedtime story or whatever. Um, And so that story has been, you know, kind of implanted in my brain since I was really young. And then I also have memories of him reading chapter books to us, like Island of the Blue Dolphins and Where the Red Fern Grows. And so Mm. he was the one that was, you know, I remember reading the chapter books. It's really strange because I don't really have any strong memories of either of my parents reading picture books. I'm sure they probably did. I just don't have that strong Mm -hmm. connection with that. But I do have memories of going to the library at a young age. And um, I still have my very first library card <laughs> that oh, I ever got. That's so cool. <laughs> I mean, I used it for like years until, you know, they got had new library cards that were available or whatever. Um, but yeah, so I have memories of going to the library and, you know, checking out um, picture books. And then um, in the house that we lived in that actually belonged to a family member, they had kind of a room that was sort of a library or had some like a lot of bookshelves and there were a lot of Newbery award winners and the Caldecotts. And I remember those, Mm. Um, you know, even though I wasn't probably reading them um, on my own at that point, but I have lots of book memories. Um, And then later on, just my parents, you know, I was a reader. I don't remember specifically learning to read, but reading was never a struggle for me. I don't ever remember mm. that being an issue. I just mm-hmm. don't remember the act of learning to read. It just, I could read. I don't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I'm sure it wasn't that easy, but um, yeah. But I, you know, I was always reading. It was fiction. I don't know if I ever picked up nonfiction as a kid unless I had to, but, you know, the Babysitter's Club and, Um, When I was a little bit older, like middle school, I remember reading uh, this author, Christopher Pike, which was kind of like R.L. Stein, kind of along those lines. Mm -hmm. I liked kind of that weird stuff. Um, And then, you know, reading into high school, you know, I I don't know. I was just always a reader. And I just I feel like I devoured books. And 
And I don't know how I picked out those books, but I always feel like I had something to read. So, okay. yeah. So, so you would you would definitely be a, ki- a a kid we would see with a pile of books in your arms, or at least somewhere yeah. nearby. Yeah. 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 Well, and do you recall when you were choosing stories, if you gravitated towards certain genres? Like, did you did you like fantasy? Did you like more realistic? What what were your, your memories as far as that? or maybe everything I mean maybe you had yeah. like a, a mixture I mean I I definitely know I liked fantasy and I was drawn to like vampires and because that kind of seemed to be a popular writing topic at that time in like the 90s mm-hmm. um but I I read realistic fiction too I I don't know if I was super picky I do have a very specific memory of I don't know if it was in elementary school or middle school but a reading assignment where I had to read a historical fiction book. And I remember going into the library and maybe asking a librarian or something for help to find historical fiction. Like maybe I hadn't really like zeroed in on that genre yet, but I, I remember the book that I picked, it's called the riddle of Pencroft farm. And it was um, kind of revolutionary war era. And that, that memory was so vivid and historical fiction is one of my absolute favorite genres now, but yeah, reading has just always been a big thing for me. And and obviously at different seasons in my life, I've read more or less, um, sure. depending on, you know, how busy I was or how much I had to read for school or whatever. But, mm-hmm. but yeah. So as far as your teaching experience goes, and then being able to be in a classroom with fourth graders, did you also teach younger children? You, you said you taught kindergartners as well, or... I mainly taught fourth. I had a year of third, and then I came back to teaching a few years later after I had my son and um, ended up with a year of kindergarten, which was would have never been my choice, but was Mm -hmm. kind of a, a good experience because I got an opportunity to kind of work more on those early like literacy skills with the younger kids. And my son was, you know, a couple years behind that. Um, I don't know if that necessarily made any difference in kind of what we did. It just gave me some exposure to something different than what I had been used to teaching because fourth grade and kindergarten are so wildly yeah. different. You know, it's a, it's a different skill set. For, sure, for sure. Yeah. So. And yeah. And like you were saying that with the fourth graders, they kind of already come with a bit of knowledge and understanding of reading and right. you're not really teaching them reading they're already kind of there. Whereas the kindergartners are, it's it's just a whole brand new world. that's just opening up for them. Um, So how do you feel like maybe those experiences in the classroom and those years that you were teaching played into who you are as a parent and as a homeschooling mom? This is such a tricky question because it all just kind of muddles together with how I think about homeschooling and teaching now. But um, Mm -hmm. I mean, they're definitely, you know, were pluses just being able to see so many different kids with different struggles. And I, I wish that I had had the knowledge that I have homeschooling, uh, when I was teaching in the classroom, because I would have had a very different perspective about a lot of things, although my hands probably would have been tied and I couldn't have maybe done some of the things that I, you know, believe more in, but, um, you know, some of those experiences and exposure definitely, gave me some background experience and whatever, but it's so different teaching, you know, 32 kids to your own two kids. Um, It's, it's Mm -hmm. so hard to even, you know, compare, but I don't regret any of the teaching experience that I have, but it also definitely wasn't for me. And I also didn't realize how free flowing I am as an educator until I was out of the classroom. So that, that was kind of an interesting Mm. thing because I thought I was going to be one way. And then I actually wasn't when it came down to it. But one thing that looking back is interesting and kind of, you know, shows that how long I've been interested in trying to help kids be readers is that, um, you know, the school has a school library but they don't provide teachers with books for their classroom. I mean, there's like the reading textbook or maybe a class set of chapter books or little readers, you know, the curriculum, but there wasn't, there were no books provided for your classroom. Interesting. And so there were so many classrooms that I went into that had hardly any books, especially in the older levels. Um, but you know, they have the scholastic book orders and those are, you know, relatively inexpensive books. So I would just, 
like I probably started when I was in college and doing like some of my student teaching, I just started building a library. Mm. And so I had, you know, two or three bookshelves full of baskets of books that were organized by, you know, topic or theme or whatever. I actually had a ton of nonfiction even in there, even though that's not necessarily what I'm drawn to. But, and I had all different levels because I actually mostly taught in schools that had a lot of kids that came in with varying degrees of English, you know, Mm. and um, I never want to limit kids to reading on their level either. True. Good. (laughs) Um, Yeah. I don't know if I realized that as much then as I do now, but I think it was kind of in there. I just didn't maybe think about it as much, but my classroom library was like my pride and joy before I had my kids. So, (laughs) so yeah. And it was so sad because when I, you know, left teaching right when I was pregnant with my oldest, I gave so many of those books away because it just wasn't reasonable for me to take those all into my home. Mm -hmm. I only kept, you know, a few and then let other teachers have them. But that was so important to me because I always wanted kids to be able to find something that they wanted to read or look at the pictures or whatever it was. I mean, there's always kids that were reluctant to even, you know, do that, but I wanted them to have a lot of choice other than just what they were allowed to pick at the school library and keep for a short time. You know, I just wanted them to be surrounded by books always. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like your instincts were very strong, even earlier on before you even had your own children. And I love what you said about having the homeschool experience and how that could have affected you as a teacher, Mm -hmm. because it's, it flips everything on its head. You know, we hear mostly about, well, I was a teacher and then I became a homeschool mom and I'm bringing this information into my homeschooling experience or, and I'm looking at my kids this way because of what I've experienced in the classroom. But that's such a fascinating way to think about it because once you have your children individually and you're able to see how they are different and unique and also how that one-on-one experience is, uh, um, affects you as the parent. And then with the as we come into our relationships with our kids, we have the, I'm the adult, I'm the authority, you know, this idea in our head about what it's going to look like. And then of course our children come in and teach us differently. (laughs) And, and it also would affect how we then perceive other children. And then you see these kids in this big setting. And I do think that it could affect maybe how you, you individualize the kids more. And yes. not you necessarily, yes. you, Nicole, but th- this, any teacher yes. in general, because the classroom setting does have a tendency to put those limits on us, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, you lump and, kids, you know, kind of whether it's intentionally or not, you know, by they're the ones that are good at reading or these are the ones that are struggling. Like it just mm-hmm. tends to be that way because that's kind of how you have to structure things to get things done because you yeah. cannot individualize it as much as they actually need. It's just impossible. It is. Well, and I remember in the third grade, very specifically being uh, put into a group of readers that were considered advanced. Mm -hmm. And I was brought to the front of the classroom (laughs) in this circle with the teacher while everyone else sat at their desk. And I remember even at that age feeling so awkward that why am I being paraded to the front of the class with six other people or whatever, however many there was just to have this special reading time. And, you know, the teacher had it like up on the board and and she had a breakout session. And I know she had to organize her class in a very specific way just to get everything done, like you said. But I remember that feeling then. So I can only imagine what it would feel like on the flip side of that, where somebody was told that they're like the, you know, the slow reader, the behind reader, they, they need to catch up, which actually leads to a question about skill level and about reading and and are you behind and what does behind really mean right. and with the you were able to see fourth graders you oversee the kindergartners and third graders as well how did how did that impact maybe the way you saw reading skill and reading skill levels and and maybe played into your ability to look at your children and be more free flowy it's kind of interesting because i don't know if i really took my experience dealing with kids in the classroom as readers and carried that very much over to my own kids. Like I've never consciously maybe thought about it that way. Um, Mm -hmm. But knowing my oldest son and just kind of, you know, he needed to be like, he needed to make the call on when he was ready for something, because if he wasn't ready, like it just wasn't going to happen. There wasn't Mm -hmm. any amount of, 
like, oh, let's just try this. Like, even if I thought he was ready, if he didn't think he was ready, nothing was going to happen. <laughs> right. He was just clay um, shut, right? He was just like, nope, yeah, not opening up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which is interesting, like on the flip side, thinking back, you know, obviously when you're teaching in the classroom, there are certain, you know, expectations that even if you can identify that a kid is maybe just not ready yet, there's not really anything you can do about that. Because once they're in school and they're in this grade, they, they're on this like track or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was very interesting because, you know, it's like, oh, in kindergarten, you know, you're reading this much and in first grade. And again, I guess what was helpful was like seeing what kindergartners were even reading. But the year I taught kindergarten was actually the first year that Common Core was sort of being tested in kindergarten. So it was even like a bigger jump up. But and which to me just absolutely shocked me how much mm. kindergartners were expected to do. It's but insane. that's kind of, yeah, it I is. was like, oh my gosh, like what is going on here? But um, I didn't ever have any, you know, like real, I don't know, expectation. I honestly, I think for both of my kids, I thought they would be earlier readers, and they actually were because I felt like with how much they were interested and loved books mm-hmm. that they would just want to dive in, but they both proved me wrong, which is, you know, interesting, but I went with it. I was okay with that. Mm-hmm. Um, my oldest, we started, you know, doing a few little things, you know, that I kind of knew from my teaching days, but tried to make it seem more fun and not very much like a lesson because my oldest son, if it looked like a lesson, even though he'd never <laughs> been in school, he was going to have nothing to do with it. He could um, sniff so, it out. <laughs> yeah. It's like, how, how do you know? <laughs> but yeah, he, like, he just doesn't, it doesn't work for him. Um, yeah. But he just, you know, we did some things, whatever. And at one point um, I had gotten the I don't even know what they're called, like Life of Fred beginning readers or something. Mm, yep, yep. And he was right around six and he just, I don't even know after that. Like I didn't teach him anymore. I don't even mm-hmm. feel like I t- taught him very much about reading. <laughs> I mm-hmm. mean, he had his sounds, you know, he could read some basic words. Sight words were just like, did not work for him. And then yeah. he, all of a sudden he could just read, I, you know? So I was like out of the picture at that point. <laughs> so did, <laughs> Other he, than, did he like the um, Life of Fred books? Did yeah, they speak to him? I, mm-hmm. I feel like those were kind of the turning point for him once we got those. Cause we had used um, some of the Life of Fred math. And so he was familiar and they're funny and silly and whatever. Mm-hmm. And so those particular books were kind of, I guess, right at the right level and he was interested enough that he just took off. And then honestly, I don't even remember what he read after that, but um, yeah. So how old would you say he was when he was reading this? I feel like he had just turned six. Okay. Well, and I was just going to back up a little bit too and ask how you, how, what did it look like in your home when your children, when he was younger and you had started homeschooling and what did it look like for, as far as books were concerned? So you obviously had a library of books. Did you all make like, specific time set aside to go to the library did you do books on tape or audio or how how did what was what was it like in your home around books very early on we had a small home library like one bookshelf full of some books that we had gotten from like his baby shower and whatever like we just made a routine out of reading at bedtime Mm -hmm. and that never changed yeah (laughs) Like not even now, really. Wow. It's shifted, but that hasn't changed. So that started when he was really young. Um, I don't know if it was like when he was a newborn, but you know, pretty soon after. And then I remember specifically when he was three, the first time he listened to an audiobook, and it was the Polar Express, and he was so engrossed. And I feel like that was a huge turning point. And he's always had, I feel like a longer attention span for sitting and listening to books than maybe other kids his age. And so we started Mm. reading, um, introducing chapter books to him um, as read alouds when he was three um, and then audio books. And so that right there was kind of where our homeschooling style started. He loved books so much, you know, being read to pretending to read, you know, like unpredictable Mm -hmm. text and whatever. Um, that when he, when we started homeschooling, when he was four, I started doing unit studies and I would, um, pick a chapter book. Well, let's say I would pick a topic. So let's say, um, dinosaurs, for example, 
um, I would get some nonfiction books about dinosaurs and then I would find a chapter book, probably um, at that age, like the Jack and Annie uh, Magic Treehouse Dinosaurs Before Mm -hmm. Dark. Mm -hmm. And that would be kind of the what would grab him is the chapter book and interesting, but then we would tie in all the nonfiction information along with what we were reading. And so that's kind of what I started doing is I would, you know, either start with a chapter book that I wanted to read to him and then find books that tied in with the topic that were nonfiction. So we're always pairing fiction and nonfiction, but the fiction was kind of like, you know, the fun special thing. And then we would, you know, do the other stuff and, um, and, That worked really well. And that's just how we homeschooled for Mm -hmm. most things. I didn't do, you know, traditional lessons with him. We mostly just read together. That's wonderful. (laughs) And I love, I love that you incorporated the reading and the audiobooks because with my special education background, that was one of the pieces that seemed like such a light bulb moment for so many teachers who weren't working with kids in the capacity that I was working with them in. And I thought, there's no rule that says you have to read the print right out of the book right. <laughs> to get the story and to and absorb yourself in the story and to learn from it. Some kids are so auditory. Mm-hmm. And I noticed that with my child, both of my kids, they loved me to read the stories mm-hmm. out loud to them. And like you said, we made a routine out of it, even from the time that they were itty bitty babies, you know, I would rock them and read little tiny mm-hmm. stories and same with um, listening to stories and that I feel like it sets up a, I don't know, maybe a mental expectation on our children to sort of hear that story and the narration uh-huh. and get involved. And, you you know, when you were talking about him pretending to read, I, my, my daughter would pick up books. I mean, this she was like a toddler, like not even really speaking in full sentences yet, and would grab a book because I was constantly reading or had something. And she would take la, 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 la. <laughs> And you could hear the sound right. change in her voice. And I was like, that is the cutest thing because she hears that inflection. Mm-hmm. She hears the, the the excitement, the exclamation, you know, how your voice changes and just sitting there on this floor, like la, 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 just going through. And I, that was a very memorable, memorable moment for me. And I realized how important it is to continue that with our kids because they do they really do. There's something, there's something very special about that. And it's super connecting as a family yes. and as a parent with your kids to snuggle up and read a story and it feels relaxing. And if, so that's the way it got going with your oldest and then your youngest came along and it sounds like maybe you all just continued doing what you were doing and it, and it flowed fairly well for him as two or did um, things shift or change at all? Things definitely shifted. <laughs> They're five years apart. Um, mm-hmm. And when my youngest came along and was still pretty young, we just, you know, we continued doing our unit studies and and just kind of doing what we were. But at some point, you know, he started to kind of get disruptive, need more attention. And so things started to shift a little bit. Um, And at some point he, um, and we listened to a lot of audiobooks in the car or we had for a while, my oldest just like, he loved that. And I enjoyed that too. And so anytime we were driving, we would listen to an audiobook. Well, my old or my youngest finally got to a point where, you know, he would be like, turn that off. I don't want to listen anymore. And he want, you know, music or he didn't enjoy the stories, you know, and Mm -hmm. obviously the stories are above his head, but he just got to a point where he was really vocal about it. I'm like, oh man, I'm so bummed that we're kind of hitting this stage where we can't listen to audiobooks in the same way or even read chapter books Mm -hmm. together. Um, So I kind of kept my chapter book reading with my oldest in the evenings when my youngest was going to bed and my husband was putting him to bed. So I, and we still continue this even now, but um, I would, you know, we'd either do an audiobook or um, I would read something aloud, or sometimes I'd ask him to read aloud to me of a chapter book. Like we always have a book in the evening going together, mm-hmm. even now that he's 12. Um, and we probably will till he moves out. <laughs> um <laughs> Because he just, like, that's how we connect. Mm -hmm. Like, we are very similar in our personalities and interests in a lot of ways. And so that's just how we connect. And he he likes that. It's just, like, comforting to him, you know, like you said. Um, But I'm so happy that now my youngest, at some point, kind of 
switched where he is all about the audiobooks now. He is all about the chapter books now. And he likes picture books too, too and we'll read those um, during the day. And he gets, you know, reading time in the evening just on his own too. But we actually, for the first time as an entire family, including my husband, all read a chapter book aloud um, at my youngest bedtime, Aww, like all of us together. Wonderful. And then he'll, you know, he'll go to bed. So I'm <laughs> so glad that it shifted back in that direction because I was sort of mourning that that, you mm-hmm. know, like period of time was kind of over, that it was going to be harder to read, but we've swung back in the other direction now. And he can handle long books. Like we're mm, reading the fourth Harry okay. Potter and- book right now. And he's, he, he's hit the phase just like my oldest has always been, but don't stop reading. Just read a couple oh, more yeah. pages. Like he's always trying to get me to do more. So I'm, I'm really happy about that. Right. right now. <laughs> well, and, but I love that you allowed it to be what it was that you didn't force it because yeah. I think that is the part of why you are able to be back in this space is that he came to it on his own and it was more natural yeah. and authentic. And he, he sees the beauty in it and he found it for himself versus it being forced upon him. And you said he's seven. Is that right? He's a, he'll be seven in about a month. (laughs) Okay. So (laughs) around seven. Well, and I think about it as far as the, what I understood with um, boys and development and reading and even compulsory schooling, you know, that technically doesn't begin until age seven Mm -hmm. in our state. And the evidence seems pretty clear and solid that that's the reason that it's at age seven is because there's a different, there's something else happening in the yes, body and the brain yes. and these connections are being made differently. And it is the time when boys and girls tend to be able to sit a little bit more longer or yeah. concentrate a bit longer. So it's neat to see that it kind of matched neurologically with, with his age and what's happening in, even in his own body. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the trajectory of each child, it's important to recognize that it's not going to look the same and even in the same family and that books have such an amazing ability to connect you not only to knowledge, but to each other. And would you say that there's, well, let's just look at maybe kind of some, some books that you might recommend for children in both of the age brackets that your boys are right now. So we'll look at your oldest first oh, and I'm sure you have a million, <laughs> <laughs> which, which I do, I do yeah. want to encourage people to follow your Instagram page at book led learning because you have so many great resources there and books and write-ups about them too. So people can always just spend time scrolling through and finding some stuff. But if there's a, even a, just a few, it doesn't have to be a lot. It's so hard to like even sift through like what he's been reading and and he's 12 um and we offered him actually some uh adult reading mm-hmm. you know like for adult level um for the first time um recently and he actually did well with it but well I'm going to say he read um Project Hail Mary by oh gosh now the author Andy Weir I think that's how you say his name which written you know for an adult level but pretty kid kid friendly as far as content so because that's that's kind of important to us um right now just making sure that he's not reading anything that's a little too mature for him even though he can Mm -hmm. read you know at a higher level or whatever but he um gosh trying to think what he's really been reading okay so this is this is not necessarily a reading level thing but he absolutely adores the garfield comics (laughs) um and he's been devouring those over and over. Like those are kind of his comfort reads right now, um, which mm-hmm. I love because it's good to have something to come back to when you need a break or when you're in between books or whatever. There's a company called um, Usborne Books and More. It's Usborne and Kane Miller, the two um, publishers, but he likes a lot of their chapter books. He's really drawn to fantasy. So he's read um, like Aragon, which is a dragon series, um, or he's read part of that and I'm glad you mentioned the comics because that is another piece of the books slash reading that I want to highlight is that they're especially for, and I don't want to categorize like in in the the most strictest way, but I have seen patterns and boys do tend to gravitate towards the graphic novels and, mm -hmm, and seeing that piece of it. And I know my son certainly did. And when I was tutoring, but when my son was younger, 
I do recall at some point there being sort of like a, I guess almost like a grade put on what books you're reading, right? Like we don't want to get in that space of saying that this book is better than this book or this type of book is better than this type of book or these types of reading, meaning like comic books. Oh, that's not important. That's not as good as it sounds like you've allowed obviously and been very open to your boys exploring and experiencing books that just speak to them regardless of whether or not they meet some sort of criteria that maybe you have in your own mind about things. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. I feel like this is something I kind of rant about sometimes is, you know, parents or teachers, parents, I feel like more unknowingly, I feel like teachers should know better, but they're so caught up in what they have to do that they kind of Mm. forget that kids and adults, anyone that's a reader, anyone that's a pre-reader should be reading anything that interests them regardless of Mm -hmm. level. Older kids absolutely should be reading picture books if there's something that interests them. You know, reading Garfield, it's obviously written for an adult mind, Mm -hmm. but the reading isn't hard. The actual reading level is not hard. My, you know, almost seven-year-old tries to read Garfield because it's less words and whatever. And, you know, it's more accessible to him than some other things. But I don't put limitations on what they read as far as level content wise I'm not too picky either I mean there's books that I'm like oh that's you know kind of not the best quality book but I also read that stuff growing up and there's a place for it Mm -hmm. in my opinion as my oldest is getting older and able to read more uh more just kind of checking in with him and you know before we maybe offer him something that's written for adults being aware of like what the content is and if we feel like maybe he's ready for mm-hmm. it um which the two book books that he's read were very science based they're science fiction um and we didn't feel like there was any content that was going to be inappropriate for him at this point or that he couldn't handle and so those were fine for him but yeah so we're pretty free flowing and that's also how I grew up my I don't remember my parents ever telling me I couldn't read something and I actually remember my dad handing me books in high school that were, you know, for adults. But now thinking back as an adult, I'm like, oh my gosh, that was, you know, like my dad handed me that. But then I'm also thinking it was fine. I wasn't like traumatized by anything or whatever. And there's kind of this separation. I mean, yes, you can read things in books that may upset you depending on who you are. Mm -hmm. But there's also like this distance between you and what's actually happening in the book. Sure that something that seems like horrible for someone to read or even know about or whatever, that can just be a way for them to experience something and understand something without experiencing that themselves, Mm -hmm. which is a kind of a safer way of learning more about the world, Mm -hmm. really. So well, and that's, that's one piece of, of reading that I have for sure seen for myself and any of the children that I've worked with is that there's some emotional intelligence that you pick up. Mm -hmm. while you're reading stories, especially from other people. And it puts you, it puts you in that position of being a witness without the negative repercussions of the the potential, you know, physical part of, of what could happen. And there's, there's some value in that. And it gives you a perspective that maybe you didn't have before or an experience that you probably might not have in your own life, but now you are able to look at the world differently And you have that in the back of your mind as well, that could be an option or that could, or now I understand what that would look like if that did happen. And, um, you know, when you said that about him uh, uh, thinking about the books that they would read and kind of considering the content of it, it made me think about video games and how (laughs) with my own son, he loved playing video games from very early age and, and I was comfortable with that. And, but there were a couple of times where some older kids wanted to play games around him or with him when he was, you know, at their house or it's just neighbor kids. And, and I remember being like, well, we, I think we need to talk about some of these that you're about to, about to experience. And, and part of it was not because I was trying to withhold him from anything. It was more like you said, you know, your kid, you know, their personalities and you kind of know what, what works for them and what doesn't. And you're just, I'm just trying to guide more than control. It's like, I understand I've seen what this video game is, or maybe I've seen what this book is about. So let's talk about it. And that's, to me, there's that space, like just have a conversation. It doesn't have to be a hundred percent no and a hundred percent yes. It can just be 
a pause for a minute and let's have a discussion and then let's figure out what it is you're trying to get out of it, what it is that you could get out of it, and then we'll go from there. So it doesn't have to be an absolute no. It There can be a space for a discussion. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's some parents that are really concerned that if their kids are reading books, but this could also be TV or video games or anything, you know, that they have access to on, you know, tech screens mm-hmm. or whatever, that um, if they're exposed to bad behavior or bad language, and I mean, it could be bad language, like the word stupid, or, you know, there's like various things that you hear that people won't allow their kids to read. Mm-hmm. And everybody is well within the right to make those decisions for their, you know, own family. Mm-hmm. But I feel like that restriction you know, depending on your kid could hold them back from really like becoming Mm -hmm. readers because there's so many limitations about what they read and not trusting that, you know, okay, if your kids picks up the word stupid or, you know, whatever that you don't like, and they're using it excessively, then you don't have to just take all those books off your shelf. Mm -hmm. You need to have a conversation about just because a character behaves this way does not mean that that is the appropriate behavior that you need to be saying this, this is not a word that we feel comfortable using in our house or whatever, but that doesn't mean the experience of, you know, seeing what these characters are doing is going to change your child necessarily. If anything, it just exposes them to more of Mm -hmm. like what the real world is like out there because not everybody's going to, you know, be the people that don't, use inappropriate language or that are just nice all the time. Like that's not real life and exposing them to some of that through a book might prepare them a little bit more in some ways for, you know, encountering that in their lives. Mm -hmm. Well, and also if they do come into contact with something that is confusing or possibly scary, if you have that relationship with them to talk about it, then they're going to come to you with it. Mm -hmm. And they would feel more comfortable coming to you and saying, hey, mom, I picked up this book and I started reading and oh my goodness, I had no idea. And this happened. And then you can have a conversation about it. And then they get to make that decision about whether or not it's something that they want to continue or they want to let go of. But if you keep, if you restrict, at least I've found, I mean, it tends to be that humans have this ability to be like, okay, you're telling me no, well, I'm going to say yes. And I'm going to say yes, even more. (laughs) Yeah. So that backfiring. And so it's an important, important piece to keep in mind. I think when creating opportunities for our kids and and being open to them, seeing the world differently. So you covered your older son and what he's sort of in Now, what would you say your, your younger son and, and also what you've seen, even maybe some of his own, um, friend group or kids around his same age reading. Let me actually jump back to my older son really quickly because um, he reads a lot of fiction at bedtime mostly. Like that's his choice at bedtime is to read fiction or his comic books or whatever. But he is very much – he'll read nonfiction to teach himself something. Like he'll read like these big Lego books about like Technic Motors or – doing like stop motion and that's completely you know on his own and like these are books that I bought way too early like before he could really access them but kept Mm -hmm. them around and then you know eventually so he does a lot of reading for learning too based on his interests at the time and he also will read like science magazines like we have popular mechanics for my husband well he reads it too you know Mm -hmm. so he just kind of yeah he picks up a lot of different things just based on kind of what he's interested in Um, my youngest who isn't quite reading independently, um, yet he's kind of like right on the edge. Like he can read some Dr. Seuss books and things like that, but he doesn't choose to read to himself yet, but he still loves books. And he actually really enjoys, uh, chapter books at bedtime. That's his choice Mm -hmm. over even picture books at this point. But for his age, I mean, he loves the elephant and piggy books still, which are just funny. Obviously that's, you know, written like kind of younger, but he still really enjoys those and can start reading them on his own now. Um, Dr. Seuss is a favorite of his, anything that's kind of silly and funny, Mm -hmm. but one of his favorite things to pick up, which is not necessarily something that's reading accessible for his age, but um, he's really interested in is the Basher science books. Okay, They're kind of like is. a little square shape and there's all bun- they actually have junior versions now of some of them. Um, but he just loves the, the pictures. They're kind of like comic like, and then we'll read the words to him 
but um, he really likes those. There's, I'm trying to remember, I think the publisher might be called Branches. They're like early chapter books um, that we read to him. There's, there's like one series called The Notebook of Doom, which my older son got into, and then we've read the entire series to him too. Um, there's all different kinds of ones that, that are geared towards younger readers that are just starting to get into chapter books, but he likes us to read those to him at this point. But mm-hmm. uh, it just, I'm pretty sure the publisher is Branches. I can look it up for you after if you want to include that in the notes. I will, for sure. That's great. Well, and do you, speaking of that, do you have um, on your Instagram page, I'm not remembering right now, like a highlight reel or anything where you highlight books that your children have read or um, that you recommend for different ages? I was posting in my stories um, our roundup of picture books that we had read for the day, which actually were kind of in a weird season right now where I'm kind of struggling to find time to fit that into our day. Like we need mm-hmm. to kind of adjust our schedule, but um, those, I don't, I actually, I do think I have, have those saved in my highlights. Okay. Um, so those are just picture books though. I don't think I shared as much, maybe like what my kids are choosing to read on their own. Mm-hmm. I've shared a lot of what my own reading is um, just because that's easier to round up than my kids' books. Um, both my boys are super into Minecraft right now. And so there's a lot of <laughs> Minecraft books in our house right now, um, which they kind of mostly do just on their own. Like, I don't want to have anything to do with it really. And that, and that, like, there's just certain things that I kind of draw a line. With. I know. Well, <laughs> Um, somewhat. Well, and that's a good point to bring up, but you don't have to be involved, right? In all of the, their reading, they no. have, they get to have their own special time doing something that's not attractive to mom. Just like you get to have your time off to the side reading, maybe a garden book and they have no interest in that or whatever. So yeah. it's nice that you have the space to enjoy what it is that each of you enjoys without having to overlap. Yeah. And it's tricky because I fully believe in you know the parents get to kind of make the call on what they read to their kids like what you read aloud because obviously Mm -hmm. you're the one that has to read it and if it's just horribly (laughs) painful to read which some books out there are you can absolutely just say no but on the other hand I also think that sometimes you should just Mm -hmm. say yes not to everything or whatever but because your if your kids are not readers yet and they don't have access to those books, but that's what's motivating them or getting them excited. I still think that Mm. you should relent and read some of it, even if it's the worst writing you've ever read and the like worst story. There's so many of those books out there, but read more of the good stuff to balance it out. And that's kind of how I always, you know, sort of justify like, yes, I'm reading this book that is awful because they want me to read it, but I'm also reading them all of these great books and that really crowds out like any I don't know but those books it's like gonna doing rock their any brain. sort of lasting damage that's not probably really the right word but you know <laughs> your kids will read mm-hmm, other things mm-hmm. even if they read those books but do give them like the good stuff too <laughs> Well, and yeah. you made me think when you were talking about the uh, the books that your younger son was was reading. My son loved <laughs> Captain Underpants, but oh, that's so funny! My kids have never gotten into it. Really? I don't know why. Yeah, yeah. It was like what's his name? Uh, Dave Pilkey, I think it is, mm-hmm. and he was into that. And I honestly, now that I'm trying to remember how he got into it, it could have been one of those library events that we went to where we yeah. just went to the library and there was a book and, and it's a, you know, it's a very attractive cover. It's this, mm-hmm. it's cartoonish and, and lots of color. And, you know, and so I would do that with him. We'd go to the library and I loved reading and my brother nicknamed me book because I read and <laughs> oh read and read when I was a child and I'm the youngest of three. And that was his nickname for me. And here, here we are all these years later, he still calls me that. And he's 56 years old (laughs) and that's my nickname. I love it. But that's just the way I was. I loved reading and I lost myself in stories all the time. And I felt like I was going to different worlds and learning about different parts of the world and different geography and different cultures and constantly, constantly read. So for me, it was not much of a stretch to start incorporating books very, very early in our, in our lives and going to the library, 
we would go to read alouds at the book at the library and I would just walk him through the rows of books and say anything that you want let's just pick it out there were a couple of times where we would start reading something and he was like I do not like this book and I'm like okay I don't really like it either let's just stop <laughs> it, it was interesting to watch how that evolved and neither one of my children are what I would consider like independent readers as like they're not going to grab a book and go be by themselves mm-hmm. like I used to so it's weird for me because I'm like oh what did I do wrong <laughs> but their dad's not that way either and so that was something that I wanted to talk to you about a little bit and just see if you've what your experience has been in that regard because I know it's super it's been a big part of your life it's been a big part of your homeschool life it's been a big part of your children's lives but did you because that your boys are different and at different ages um do you see can you I get you can't tell, predict the future, so I'm not going to ask you to do that. But what about the idea that possibly books may not be as big of a part of their lives in the future? Do you think that that's – does it look like that that would ever change, or do you think that you it's so established now? It's hard to say with my youngest, especially since he's not reading independently yet. So, you know, I'm offering him books, but will – that change when he's reading more on his own. It's hard to say. He definitely Mm. is more my math brained kid. Like, I don't know where that comes from because it doesn't come from me. And he just like, (laughs) as soon as he could talk, it was just numbers and math coming out of his mouth. I mean, he's, he just Mm. sees the world in a different way that way, but he also really does enjoy stories. And he also, I think sees books as a way to get information that he wants because he's, you know, loves science. And, you know, he picked up one of those basher science books off the library shelf and it was like microbiology. And he was, I don't know, four or something or five, you know, drawn to the pictures, but still the subject too. And so he likes, you know, reading because he gets something out of it, you know, content wise, but also just enjoys Mm -hmm. stories too. But again, like I said, I it's hard to say with him. My oldest, I see him being a reader like forever, especially since he's not, he's probably going to be my kid that will never set foot in a public school. I don't know about college, but like he, I, he has no interest in high school and he's not there mm-hmm. yet, but he won't be bogged down with assigned reading in other words. So I don't think that will be an issue with him. Um, but One thing that's interesting as he's getting older, and I read a really good book last year called Reading in the Wild by Donna Lynn Miller. She's actually a public school teacher that teaches reading in, I think, middle school, maybe elementary school too. This is maybe her second book. It's the second book of hers I've read, but she talks a lot about reading behaviors that readers take part in and seeing how, you know, when kids are in her class for a year, they're exposed to all this support and all these different things. But when they leave her classroom, you know, some of them continue reading, but some of them don't. Hmm. And, and why is that? Well, she didn't set it up to teach them, you know, how to do these reading behaviors, like talking about books with other people, deciding what you're going to read next. Um, you know, they didn't know how to do that on their own. So I started thinking about, okay, well, my oldest loves reading and he's constantly reading, but I'm always kind of feeding books to him too. How much of this could he do on his own? So we started kind of working on that as I was more kind of aware of just even the idea that, you know, just because he's an average reader right now, if he doesn't go away with you know, some of these skills to keep himself reading once Mm -hmm. he's older, he might not read as much, you know, later on, or it would be easier for it to drop off, you know, as life gets busy and and whatever. So that was kind of an interesting thing to think about as he's getting older that I need to actually, you know, kind of teach him or work with him on some of these skills, things that I do naturally now, but I also feel like I kind of figured out on my own because Mm -hmm. I was just so drawn to reading, but not everybody does. I think it just kind of depends on their personality. So that's a really interesting perspective and, and, and something I didn't actually think about because for me, I'm like you, it's just so natural for me. I started doing it at a very young age. My parents never really said to me, Hey, you should go into your room and read a book. It was just, I did it. I I would read (laughs) encyclopedias and I just loved knowledge and seek and reading and seeking. And so 
being intentional about those the steps that are involved to ensure that you have the supports in place for continuing a passion or an interest that you have. I mean, I, I liken it to a child maybe who enjoys acting or who enjoys um, some sort of a, a sport that it, even though it might be something that you can do in isolation, it is enjoyed more right. with others. And your son is getting such enjoyment out of it because of the fact that y'all have a connection through reading mm -hmm. and that maybe, you know, he's getting some feedback from you that if that's not there anymore, it might not make reading as interesting or exciting. Right. And also just trying to be aware of, you know, does he want to talk with other, you know, kids his age or other people about books the same way that mm -hmm. I need to, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and not wanting to push him into like being me, mm -hmm. you know, but also maybe he just hasn't really thought about that. And, and maybe the other kids don't really think about talking books, but if they started doing that, you know, just kind of organically when they get together or, or even if we set up something, you know, would they do that a little bit more often? Cause it's like, you know, where do you get your book ideas from? Well, mom's not going to, well, I probably will actually always be sending him book ideas forever, but <laughs> you know, creating a community of his own with kids that are reading, you know, the same kinds of things that he's interested in. And so it'll be interesting to see how that kind of shows up in his life moving forward from here. Um, Mm hmm. Yeah, there's a lot. I think there's a lot of space for that. And it sounds like too, with his b being a bit older, and then with the high school years sort of ahead of you, there might be an opportunity to create book clubs and events around different book genres, even or, or even meeting authors yeah. and, and things like that. Yeah, that would be really interesting. Um, and we actually do like family book clubs. And it really kind of started a few years ago with our first like Harry Potter camp, which was basically just a, like a glorified book club. <laughs> um, but we still do that kind of thing. Um, I think that uh, Julie Bogart from Brave Writer calls it like party school. Mm -hmm. um, a friend of mine uh, introduced me kind of to this concept of doing a book club but not just sitting around and having a discussion like from some questions, but it's more like an experience where there's themed food and activities and whatever. And the kids don't necessarily sit down and discuss the book at these events, but they're just kind of having a culminating experience together around something that we all read like within our own homes. Um, but now as we are having some older kids and some of the kids I think have actually talked about like, Ooh, there's this, you know, new book that's coming out in this series that a bunch of them like, maybe like they'll try to set up, you know, something. So I think it's kind of starting, but sometimes I think they just need the idea kind of planted in their head first, because they may not think about it the way that we do that are used to planning things for our kids like this and, and whatever. So. Well, and it's nice because they'll, they know that you have, they have your support. You're there yes. to help direct and guide and, and offer resources and whatever is needed. But I love I love the idea of getting together and having an event around a book and it's like a full body experience and, yes. <laughs> and you're connecting over a story and it's almost as if, you know, you're becoming characters even in the story and really getting to have that. It, it takes it away from just being something you do in isolation and you're enjoying it with others. And so it kind of makes the story even stick and become more memorable to, to each individual yeah. as well. And, and I love it as much as the kids do. We actually did um, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe sometime before Christmas. I can't remember if it was November. And I made a wardrobe out of cardboard. And like we just try to recreate a lot of the feeling kind of from the story and let the kids, you know, sort of like move through it as if they were the characters a little bit. So you're so creative. <laughs> I'd love what you've put out there. And it, it makes me wish that I'm like, oh, I wish I would have known you when my kids were younger. <laughs> But it's true. I mean, it's fun for the kids to see you get as excited yes. about it. I think that they, our kids love it when we play with them and get into the stuff that they're also into and, and they see that we can appreciate the joy that it's bringing them. So before we wrap up, I, I would love it if you could just give some, maybe some direction to, to parents who are either just starting out homeschool, regardless of what age their kids are, about 
reading and what how to possibly incorporate it a little bit more into your life. I mean, you mentioned already about reading together very consistently at night. So your kids understand that this is part of your routine and and how how do you think parents who maybe didn't have that starting out could incorporate a bit more reading and books into their lives? So it's never too late. Now I can't speak to having an older kid that's not used to being read aloud to and how that might go because that's not our experience. But I know that people Mm -hmm. have incorporated read aloud with their older kids, um, even if they hadn't, you know, experienced it before or are reluctant because they're older and it feels weird to be read to. Um, Mm -hmm. But don't give up, even if that's your situation. But like you said, um, I think the most important thing is to just make it a regular habit and don't feel like you need to read aloud for an hour. Um, Start with 10 minutes, Mm -hmm. you know, make regular library trips, have books around, you know, maybe um, if you're just starting out uh, and you, whatever age your kids, if they can kind of weigh in, you know, have a couple of books that you selected, you know, to read aloud from like a chapter book and you know, kind of do like a little book talk or read the back of the book, you know, and kind of let them look at the cover and maybe let them vote or choose, you know, what interests them and then read that and 10 Mm -hmm. minutes a night or a chapter a night, or it doesn't even have to be at night because obviously everybody's schedules are different. Meal times can be really good times to read. Obviously you can't eat while you're reading yourself, but (laughs) if it's like breakfast or lunch and you're not all trying to like eat at the same time or whatever you can, that's what I will read during lunchtime or even a snack because it actually keeps my kids a little bit busier and we can read longer if they're eating. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's a good tip too, but yeah, just finding an anchor, something that you do every day, or maybe have a couple options if your schedule changes a lot bit and just start with 10 minutes mm-hmm. and, you know, pretty soon your kids are going to want to know what's going to happen next in that story. And they're going to remind you, but it's, you know, it's like starting a new habit, you know, just make sure you do it every single day. And if you miss a day, don't miss a second day, try to keep picking up that book. And hopefully, you know, you pick something that you're enjoying too. So you feel like you want to sit down and read it. Um, mm-hmm. Audiobooks are also a great option if you don't feel comfortable reading aloud yet, or when you have your kids in the car and you're driving to activities. Um, and there's so many good narrators out there that you really can't go wrong most of the time with, um, an audio book and maybe start with something short. The who was, um, like biography series is a really good, like short and interesting, even for adults to jump into, if you want to, you know, start with something that's not too overwhelming, but yeah. And, and go to the library. The library is your best friend. Mm -hmm. Have some books that are yours that are, you know, on your bookshelves, but you don't need to buy everything you're going to read. Honestly, that's impossible. It is. Yeah. Um, so go to the library, go frequently, you know, get your kids, their own library card. I was going to say that. Um, yep. It does make a huge difference. It really like does. Even when they're babies mm-hmm. or whatever age your library allows them to have a library card, get them a library card and don't put limits on what they're allowed mm-hmm. to check out. <laughs> like let them just go and like raid the library, grab whatever looks interesting, whether you agree with it or not. I mean, obviously within reason that if they're in the kids section, mm-hmm. it's generally pretty okay. But, you know, just let them go and make it a no pressure thing. And then you check out books, too. Like, I am guilty of, you know, if we bring, like, our big cart or something, that I have to be careful that I don't (laughs) max out my library cards because I find so many kids' books, I can't help myself, you know. (laughs) Well, and I noticed, too, in the mornings with my children, one would get up earlier than another. And those were wonderful times to read together because yes. I would just be in the living room maybe and they would just come plop on the floor beside me. And we always had piles of books sitting in different places. So we had some in the living room. We had some in bedrooms. Even when they were playing, I might, just, like you said, just start reading something. And it was amazing to me how many times they would stop what they were doing and just come snuggle up beside to listen to the story yes. and look at the pages. And the other thing I wanted to add as you were talking, as I said, it always just spurs memories and ideas is that 
one thing I know for my children, and I've seen it with a lot of other kids too, is that there are certain books that they will want you to read over and over and over Uh again. And there are days where you're like, do I have to read (laughs) The Big Brown Cow or whatever it is again? I feel like I've read it 17,000 times, but they're getting something out of it. Yes. And they're learning the patterns and they're hearing the words and they're making those connections. And before you know it, they're reading it to you. And that's how that language development builds on itself. And um, and I even saw to the beauty in books related to different seasons. So like maybe go to the library around Halloween time and get all the Halloween books. Yes. And the same with Christmas or Easter or anything and in any topic that you can get a bunch of books around that it seems as if they can, you know, pick and choose which ones speak to them. So like my kids were really interested in weather for a while. So we got all these weather books that talked about tornadoes and hurricanes. And, and so you could see how, like you were mentioning earlier, the, the nonfiction and fiction, how those two can marry together so well to super emphasize a fact or knowledge base and, and encourage an interest even more. So they get to see all angles and I think that's what creates that more wider skill set by giving kids different lenses to look at the world through. And that's what I love about I love about books. They really can do that for us. Yes. Um, so before we leave, though, do you have anything like just for fun? Are there any things that people would be surprised to know about you or? I mean, I feel like the thing I always say is that I am an Irish dance teacher. <laughs> That's, that's sort of like my, my thing on the side that, um, you know, I've been doing that. I've been Irish dancing since I was 15. Um, I kind of was off, off and on again, like through college and, and teaching, but came back to dance and compete as an adult. And then when my son was born, I kind of switched over to teaching and that's what I do now, but, um, yeah. So I guess that's sort of my thing and that I'm learning to mountain bike along Mm. with my, like my kids and my husband do it, but I'm the last one. So that's like my new skill I'm learning right now. Well, and tell me how that feels different than, I mean, obviously you're going oh. through different terrain and things like that. So is that part of what makes it more difficult is that you just are not on flat ground? Yes. And I, I'm just a scared person. Okay. <laughs> like, I don't know. I remember being a kid and going skiing and like being terrified, mm. like going down a hill. I feel like I don't have control. And that's mm-hmm. the same thing for, you know, mountain biking. And, and I haven't even, you know, really ridden a bike much of all and, or much at all until very recently since I was probably in like middle school. So it's been a really long time without even being on a bike. And I resisted, you know, cause my parents mountain bike and, you know, my three guys mountain bike. And it's like, okay, when my youngest gets old enough that he's not, you know, being left behind as much then it would make more sense. Mm-hmm. There's no sense in, you know, me getting a bike to go do this thing when somebody still needs to stay with him. And and he can't bike as much as everybody else yet, but he's, I mean, he can bike better than I can. <laughs> so, you know, but so, but it's fun. It surprised me. Um, it's, it's definitely a humbling experience to kind of be in a situation where I feel really uncomfortable doing something. Yeah. Um, because I feel like I probably, stay in my comfort zone a little Mm -hmm. bit too much Um, with a lot of things like dance feels so natural to me even when I'm learning something entirely new I'm like I can handle this like it doesn't stress me out but this is like a whole nother Mm -hmm. whole nother thing for me so it's good for my brain (laughs) well that's and that's what kids do too right they push us out of our comfort zone so many times and even if you get to a point where you're like okay I really gave it a try I, I put my all into it and it's just not for me you can just offer to be the photographer (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah and You're I'm like, like I'll uh, always be happy staying at home with my book or whatever mm-hmm. but this is this is good and it'll be good for me to be able to go out with them and you know do these things and not just see the pictures or my husband's videos mm-hmm. afterwards or whatever so yeah yeah create yeah. memories with them through through their shared interest can I share a couple books really quick even if even if you just uh like put them in the show I notes. would love for you um, to yes so I love reading about reading, um, and I read a few recently. Um, one that's a great one to start with is uh, The Read Aloud Family by Sarah McKenzie, who has her own podcast about books, mm. which is amazing. Um, she talks about all different kinds of books. So great podcast and great book um, for any age of kids that you have. And she's a homeschooler, okay. too. 
And then The Enchanted Hour by Megan Cox Gurdon. Um, I read that one last year and actually got to hear her speak um, as a keynote speaker for the Usborne Books and Work Convention last year, which was really cool. But she, um, it, her book's called The Miraculous Power of Reading Aloud in the Age of Distraction. Mm-hmm. And that has a lot of um, like brain-based research in it and then just talks about all about reading aloud. Such a good book. And the audio read by her is really good too. Well, that sounds um, like a book right up my alley. I, yes. Uh, yes. That, yeah. That's amazing. I love the neuroscience behind Don't Miss Any. Yeah. And then the one I mentioned earlier was Reading in the Wild. And I can't remember the title of her first book. I want to say it might be The Book Whisperer by Donna Lynn Miller. And then another book that isn't about books, but kind of is like self-directed learning, but not specific to homeschool is The Self-Driven Child. Mm by William Stixrud. I'm not sure if that's how you say it. And Ned Johnson, that one's just an excellent read for any parent. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Have you read that one? I haven't read that one. No. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You need to read this right up your alley. (laughs) Yeah. That sounds great. Well, and you're right. I I would love to get a list of all of those and put them in the show notes. Do you have, do you have a website? I don't. Um, Okay. It was a kind of a passing thought to have a blog, but honestly creating a blog, is very overwhelming. Mm-hmm. It can be. <laughs> and so that's on hold. Yeah. So just, just my Instagram account, which again, I'm, I'm not super active on at the moment, but um, there's plenty of content that people can kind of go back mm-hmm. through my feed for. Like I have um, like read aloud tips and helping um, reluctant readers. Like I have some uh, graphics, like with some of that kind of stuff on there that people can go okay. back and kind of look at. So it would be neat to get like a list of books for the preschool age and the list of books for, you know, the middle school age. But it's also that that special educator in me knows that sometimes it's nice to just not put lists together and just let yeah. kids go. Because I, yeah. I even found that with some of the kids I'd worked with who maybe were fifth graders, but they technically were on a lower reading level. So it was like they needed to find the books that f- spoke to them and I don't know. There, there's a like a weird market out there that needs to be filled for kids who maybe, who who have the ability to understand more than they're able to read. You know what I mean? Yes, and I mean there's something to be said too for just teaching kids to open up a book that they might pick up at the library and kind of um, do like the Goldilocks rule, like how many words can you read on this page. You know, and if you put like, I can't remember if it's like five fingers down, like it's probably a little bit too hard for you. But I would also say if they're very motivated to read the book, to try it anyways, because they might surprise themselves, or maybe that's something that they find, you know, either an audio version of to listen to or have someone read it aloud to them so they can still access that book that they're really wanting to read. But yeah, and when you're reading to your kids out loud, I mean, read your young kids the chapter book, even if they aren't getting all of it, if they're interested in it read it. Such wise, wise words, right? I completely agree. If we hope to support a love of books, it takes intentional action on our part and a willingness to say yes, even if the topic is not what we would choose for ourselves. Speaking of action, here are some additional thoughts Nicole shared with me that I did not capture on our recording, but I feel are important to add. She says, I wanted to touch on the power of modeling, reading yourself as the parent. Putting your own reading life on display in subtle ways like having a stack of books where you like to read, talking about books you've read, checking books out for yourself at the library, reading in front of your kids, and so on. If being a reader yourself is part of your lifestyle, your kids will be more likely to be readers themselves. And if you aren't a reader, ask yourself why you aren't. You might be surprised at what you find. It's never too late to become a reader again. Enjoying the books you read with your kids is a good place to start. You can visit Nicole's Instagram page at book.led.learning. You will find plenty of books and creative ideas that will undoubtedly add value and fun to your child's and your own reading journey. As always, stay curious, stay connected, and stay aware. Until next time.